Uh, three things to say before I actually begin. First of all, uh, all dates are BC, unless otherwise stated, or obviously not so. Uh, second, if I collapse into coughing, uh, it's that time of year. It's asthma plus uh, allergies time of year. And um, what was the middle thing again? Oh, yeah. Uh, if a giant cat shows up and uh, proceeds to, uh, to basically take over, uh, that's our, our enormous 14-year-old um, Maine Coon Cat buddy, and this is his me time, which I am usurping. So with all of that, let's get started. Cleopatra, shown here in two versions, Greek and Egyptian, was the last of the Ptolemies. A family of purebred Macedonian aristocrats, they'd ruled Egypt as God incarnate since the death of Alexander the Great. Unlike some of the other Hellenistic dynasties, they never intermarried with their subjects, but married their sisters every other generation to keep it all in the family. As you see here, though, they cleverly utilized both Greek and Egyptian styles for their art, portraiture including. But let's go back to the beginning. Whoops, let's go forward first of all, so I have that title slide on. There we go. Uh, Conqueror of Anatolia, Egypt, the Near East, and Persia at 25, and Afghanistan and uh, Northwest India at 30. By 323 BC, Alexander ruled the largest empire yet seen on this planet, over 2 million square miles of it. You can see at top right the um, outline of the United States superimposed upon his empire, and uh, the two are quite similar in, uh, in um, um, area. Always striving to do it, outdo his heroic ancestors, Heracles and Achilles, and allegedly keeping Homer's Iliad under his pillow, one wonders, all 24 books of it, he must have slept badly. Alexander regarded the king of the gods, Zeus Amun, as his real father and accepted no limits to his power. Alexander wanted it all, Asia, Africa, and Europe all three continents together. Hence an epigram appended to one of the sculptor Lysippus's bronzes of him, a miniature replica of which is shown at bottom left. This statue seems to look at Father Zeus and say, you keep Olympus, me let earth obey. Then, having been declared a god by many of the Greek cities and indeed by his own army, in th May 323, age 33, Alexander fell ill and died. Just read the top of the screen. And that is what ensued. By the 270s, 50 years after his death, these rival contenders for Alexander's throne had been reduced to three. The rump kingdom of Macedonia, ruled by the descendants of Demetrius Poliorcetes, the Antigonids. The Seleucid Empire, <coughs> ruled by the descendants of Seleucus, Nicator. And last but certainly, certainly not least, the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt, Cyprus, and much of the Near East, uh, ruled by the descendants of Ptolemy I, Sota. Note, however, their rivals to East and West, particularly the West, the rising power of Rome. Now, since this is a lecture about Cleopatra, the last of the Ptolemies, not about the Hellenistic world in general, let's fast forward 200 years or so. <clears throat> Squeezed as if in a vice by the Romans to the West and the Parthians to the East, by the 60s BC, these three great empires had been reduced to just one, the fabulously rich Ptolemaic Empire based on Egypt and its stunning capital on the right, Alexandria. This was where Cleopatra first saw the light of day uh, in January 69 BC. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, her father was Ptolemy the Twelfth, and uh, the names of these um, of these uh, Ptolemies uh, lengthen as their power contracted, 
Neos Dionysos Theos Philopato of Theos Philadelphus, the new Dionysus, the God father, father loving and the God brother loving, nicknamed Aulites, the flute player. Here you see him in a portrait in Paris uh, from Egypt, wearing actually not the diadem, the uh, uh, insignium of royalty of the Hellenistic monarchs, but the forehead band of his favorite god, Dionysus, the Mitra. Uh, a playboy, in 59 BC, he bribed Caesar to recognize him as friend and ally of the Roman people. In 51, he died, his kingdom on the ruin, on the brink, pardon me, of ruin and revolution. The Nile floods failed. <clears throat> His young son, Ptolemy XIII, only 10 years old, was himself ruled by his advisors, who uh, suggested, probably insisted, that Ptolemy XIII and, um, and uh, Ptolemy XII's 18-year-old daughter, Cleopatra, became, <coughs> should become joint rulers and should marry. Now, Cleopatra has fascinated the Western imagination from, from the Renaissance to the present. Here, an early um, uh, essay in Western painting, uh, Cleopatra's Suicide by Gian Petrino. And here's something a li little bit more recent, uh, Liz Taylor in Cleopatra and Andy Warhol's response to it in 1963. I'm gonna read to you because I rather like it. Jerry Seltz's <clears throat> review of uh, of um, his exhibition, Warhol's exhibition, uh, his um, pictures of Liz as Cleopatra. And Salt said, said this in The New Yorker, you can almost feel how bad the movie was and the ways that Warhol allows the images to overlap and appear off register and piled up. The film sprocket slip before your eyes. Yet the pictures of Liz exude a primitive hit of graphic power, seething glamour, repressed sexuality and flawed beauty. She's a modern religious icon or Medusa. It's as if something about Taylor's instability and image made Warhol mirror her future in his pictures. Well, if that's how the modern world, at least the 60s, saw Cleopatra, this is how the ancient world saw her, as two-faced, Greek and Egyptian in the traditional Ptolemaic manner. Theirs was a biracial and bifurcated kingdom. Hollywood to the contrary, Cleopatra was no stunning beauty. She was, however, strikingly gifted <clears throat> and highly intelligent. I'm trying to make this go, far, go forward. Ah, there we go. Uh, and here we uh, have to resort to, uh, or we have to, uh, cite Plutarch's Life of Antony, which is one of our main sources for her reign. Her beauty, as we are told, was in itself not altogether incomparable, nor particularly striking, but conversation with her had an irresistible charm, and her presence, combined with the persuasiveness of her conversation and the character she showed in her behavior towards others, had something stimulating about it. There was a sweetness also in the tones of her voice, and her tongue like an instrument of many strings, she could readily turn to whatever language she pleased, so that in her interviews with barbarians, she very seldom needed an interpreter, but made her replies to most of them herself and unassisted, whether they were Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Jews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes, or Parthians. Indeed, it is said that she knew the speech of many other peoples too, although the Ptolemaic kings of Egypt before her had never even made an effort to learn the native language, and some actually had given up their Macedonian di dialect. As a result, the uh, image on the right from a stele from the Fayum dedicated by one Onophorus, uh, showing Cleopatra, she's on the right-hand side, by the way, making an offering to Isis, shows her as a bare-chested, kilted pharaoh in strict Egyptian manner, that is exactly how in the Old Kingdom and the New Kingdom, uh, female pharaohs were shown, Hatshepsut, for example, but also how her predecessors, Arsinoe II, Berenike IV, and so on, in the Ptolemaic dynasty had been shown. The inscription below, of course, is in Greek. 
recording the dedication and giving us the date. Uh, very quickly, Ptolemy 13 and Cleopatra fell out uh, in 50, just a fair year after uh, their father's death. Civil war between them, or rather between their advisors, uh, uh, broke out. Cleopatra lost and was driven into exile. Now, meanwhile, however, the Colossus to the west, Rome, had been consumed by civil war as well. In January 49, Caesar famously crossed the Rubicon, and his great rival Pompey and his senatorial supporters fled to Greece. Caesar followed them, defeated Pompey and the senatorial uh, uh, faction at Pharsalus in June 48. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Pompey fled immediately to Egypt, where he was murdered as he stepped on the beach. Caesar followed him and installed himself in the palace of Alexandria. And then comes the famous scene, which any of you who've seen the 1963 movie, the Burton and Taylor movie, will remember, where Cleopatra uh, had herself rolled up in a carpet and delivered to uh, Caesar, and the carpet dramatically gets unrolled in front of him as he sits on the throne of the Ptolemies. That actually is historical, and it's related once again by Plutarch. Caesar, predictably immediately smitten, proceeded to proclaim Cleopatra and her second little brother, Ptolemy XIV, born in 59, as joint rulers of Egypt. This is where we begin our act two, uh, Cleopatra and Caesar. A spectacular love affair then ensued. Caesar was 51 at the time. She, by this point, had reached majority. She was 21. And they took the traditional cruise up the Nile, where traditional things, of course, happened. Nine months later, uh, a son, Ptolemy the 15th, Caesarion, little Caesar, was born. Here's a portrait of him in basalt, showing him uh, quite unrealistically as a, uh, as a young man, uh, probably created when he was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, little Caesar, the son of Caesar and uh, Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. So since we've got both Greek and Egyptian style images on the screen, let's spend a moment looking at them. Uh, notice on the left in an inscribed limestone um, statuette, actually, of Cleopatra in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, how she's dressed. She's dressed in so-called Isis costume. There's a cartouche giving her name on her right shoulder. Uh, no, she is not bare-breasted. It's a uh, typically Egyptian way of just simply showing the body underneath the clothing. Um, and in this case, the woman's fertility. Carrying a cornucopia in her left hand, uh, which is one of the badges of the dynasty. And on her head, plastered across her wig, uh, that is the triple Urias, the triple cornucopia, which Cleopatra appears to have invented. Uh, all previous pharaohs back to the Old Kingdom had carried uh, a single Urias on their, um, uh, uh, on their uh, diadems. But um, we don't actually know why the triple Urias um, except for one obvious reason, it sort of triplicates her power. Uh, if there is uh, some ulterior meaning or not, it's been lost to history. This style goes back to the first great queen of uh, Egypt, uh, Arsinoe II. Here an inscribed um, uh, image of her uh, in uh, Berlin, if I, if I remember rightly. Um, inscribed king's daughter, king's sister, king's wife, daughter of Amun, mistress of the two lands, upper and lower Egypt, uh, Arsinoe the divine brother loving who lives forever. Unfortunately, she didn't, she died in 270. And here, perhaps the best um, portrait that we possess in Egyptian style of Cleopatra, or indeed perhaps of any of the Ptolemies in St. Petersburg, a basalt uh, statue of her. Uh, um, must have been created around about 40 BC or so. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, notice, by the way, once again, she's uh, actually, not, of course, not naked. You can see the neckline of her dress. You can also see it just above her feet. Her eyes, by the way, would have been inlaid in um, some precious uh, and certainly dazzling material. So she's looking above your head. And on her head would have been one of the Egyptian crowns, perhaps the hem hem crown, um, uh, inserted into a socket, a socket on her um, uh, the top of her skull. Let's compare this with a uh, splendid uh, portrait head of her, uh, perhaps from Egypt, acquired by the Berlin Museums in the 1970s. Um, again, dated at about the same time. And here you see very starkly um, presented the two different styles of the Ptolemies. Uh, the Egyptian one looking to uh, the Egyptian Chora, uh, that is the lands outside Alexandria, and the um, uh, Greek one looking to uh, the lands, uh, Alexandria and the lands to the north and east settled by the Greeks after Alexandria. The two styles, give a little bit of art historical speak, the two styles actually start from opposite ends of the sculptural spectrum. Uh, the Egyptian sculpture, you might be able to discern this, begins with an ideal volume here, two ovoids, an ovoid for the face, uh, the inner one, and an outer one, an ovoid for the wig, and then proceeds to humanize them. The Greek sculptor, starts from the other end, a real living human physiognomy, and then proceeds to idealize it. Both, uh, pardon me, the, the um, uh, head on the right is actually an insertion bust. It was never exhibited as a bust. And we can tell from the neckline that it was inserted into a draped statue. Uh, the same would be true of uh, a head of her great predecessor, Arsinoe II in Marimont. Uh, almost uh, 250 years prior to this, um, where you can see that the bust has been rather badly damaged. Uh, and again, her crown has disappeared. Another um, innovation of Cleopatra, the broad diadem uh, here, still re retaining part of its purple color on the right-hand side, as opposed to the narrow diadem uh, of uh, Arsinoe and the Ptolemies, and in fact, all the other Hellenistic kings before her. So we have the triple Urias and the broad diadem allow us to identify otherwise uninscribed portraits of Cleopatra, particularly the Egyptian ones, which is so heavily depersonalized that otherwise one would find it very difficult to tell. So imitating uh, both uh, Arsinoe and back for her, the goddess Aphrodite, the Berlin portrait on the right incorporates the physiognomy of both god goddess and queen while remaining her own woman. Subtle and smooth to an in-group audience, it would have recreated the aura of the Ptolemaic kingdom at its third century height. Let's go back to history. In 46, Caesar triumphed in Rome. Cleopatra followed him to secure her dream of resurrecting the glories of Ptolemaic Egypt with Roman backing. Predictably, the Roman people were hostile. They had a well-founded suspicion of foreign queens, particularly foreign queens who were conducting love affairs uh, with their own magistrates. Caesar, however, besotted with Cleopatra, dedicated a golden statue of her in the temple of Venus and Rome, a statue obviously assimilating her to Aphrodite. We wish we had it, we don't. From this period, however, what we do have is another insertion bust, clearly of the same type as the Berlin Cleopatra, but uh, radiating a rather uh, more forbidding countenance, a forbidding face, perhaps some much nearer to her coins. We wish we had the nose, but it was damaged in antiquity, uh, subsequently restored, and that restoration has now been taken off. Hence that rather nasty um, uh, 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 flame down the nose where the tip of it should be. Uh, this is what we call a Western portrait of her, emphasizing her determination and authority. Contrary to 
um, an increasing tendency, at least among people who don't study this material, uh, but simply uh, comment on it and critique it. This is not a hostile portrait of her. There was no such thing in antiquity. All ancient portraits were uh, created on commission and they were intended one way or other, if not completely to flatter, at least to present a positive image of the sitter. So if we um, interpret an ancient portrait as being in some way hostile or whatever, um, then we are wrong. Uh, so how do you explain it? Well, uh, we do so by wondering whether it was commissioned either by Cleopatra herself or possibly Caesar or one of Caesar's supporters to conform to current Roman Republican so-called theoristic standards, standards where, whereby the portrait should reflect certain Roman virtues such as gravitas, severitas, auctoritas, gravity, severity, authority, and so on, be it male or female. Then came the Ides of March, 44 BC. Everything fell apart. Caesar was murdered in the Senate house by Brutus and Cassius. Cleopatra fled Rome that night and managed to escape to Egypt, where she was received in Alexandria with a rapturous um, reception. Meanwhile, in Rome, civil war had broken out again. As Octavian, Caesar's nephew and heir, heir and Mark Antony, Caesar's right-hand man, swore to avenge the murdered Caesar. Octavian, born in 63, was only a teenager. Antony, however, was almost 40, a seasoned general, a soldier's man. His guardian god was also Dionysus, or rather, in Roman parlance, Bacchus. History then proceeded to repeat itself. Caesar's murder, murderers and their senatorial supporters promptly fled to Greece. Octavian and Antony followed with their respective armies, and the two sides clashed at the Battle of Philippi in 42, two years after Caesar's murder. Octavian and Antony triumphed, and over the bodies of Brutus and Cassius, who both committed suicide, uh, agreed to divide the Roman Empire between them. Antony then proceeded to marry Octavian's sister, Octavia, to guarantee imperial unity despite the division of the empire. This marriage and this dissolution was to prove crucial uh, in the following years. Antony then departed for the East where diplomatic exchanges soon began between him and Cleopatra as a queen of the Ptolemaic Empire. Here you see embodying that um, agreement between them, a silver denarius of Octavian and Mark Antony. These are obverse and reverse of the same coin uh, and uh, a much later portrait of Antony uh, in the uh, Vatican, probably created about 100 30, 140 years after his death, to judge by its um, technique and style. So uh, we left Antony uh, asking Cleopatra to meet him uh, and in his new realm in the East. Finally, after she had temporized for quite a while, uh, in October 41, Antony summoned her to meet him at Tarsus which is in the top right-hand corner, if you will, of the Mediterranean, just north of Cyprus. This, by the way, is how uh, a recent attempt, um, uh, a computerized reconstruction of the two, has uh, attempted to uh, restore uh, or reconstruct their physiognomies. You must take these with a pinch of salt, but never, nevertheless, perhaps gives us some idea how the two may have looked like. Uh, the um, upshot, again recorded by Plutarch, is one of the great set piece scenes of Hellenistic history. And I want to um, illustrate it by a serendipitous discovery of mine, uh, walking in um, Milan one day uh, in the, uh, um, the great um, uh, covered uh, shopping center. Uh, in 2007, I happened to pass uh, the uh, Cartier shop 
And lo and behold, in the window was this, uh, an enormous recreation of Cleopatra's royal barge on this occasion, uh, uh, straight out of um, uh, Plutarch's uh, pages. So uh, uh, unfortunately, I, did, I didn't even dare to go inside to find out how much it was. I couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't bring myself to. Instead, I simply photographed it through the window. So what Plutarch says is this, after Cleopatra had received many letters of summons, both from Antony himself and from his friends, she sailed up the river Kidnus in a barge with a gilded poop, its sails spread purple, its rowers urging it on with silver oars to the sound of the flute blended with pipes and lutes. Cleopatra herself reclined beneath a canopy, spangled with gold, adorned like Aphrodite in a painting. Here I show you one just to uh, show you how the Romans at least would have envisaged this. While boys like Erotes in painting stood on either side and fanned her. Likewise, also the fairest of her slave girls, dressed like Nereids and Graces, were stationed, some at the steering oars and others at the reefing lines. Wondrous odors from countless incense offerings diffused themselves along the river banks. Of the inhabitants, some accompanied her on either bank of the river from its very mouth while others went down from the city to behold the sight. The throng in the marketplace gradually streamed away to watch them, until at last Antony himself, seated on his tribunal, was left alone. And a rumor spread on every hand that Aphrodite was come to revel with Dionysus for the good of Asia. Again, this is how at least uh, Greeks and Romans would have envisaged what transpired, yet another spectacular love affair, duly celebrated in, uh, not in, uh, in uh, ancient painting, as far as we know, but certainly in Western painting and elsewhere. This is uh, Tiepolo's version of their meeting, uh, which has always interested me because Tiepolo clearly envisages the, the ruination of the, of the Ptolemaic kingdom if you see the uh, building on the right-hand side, architecture in uh, Renaissance and Baroque painting always signifies. Uh, anyway, here is Cleopatra meeting uh, the besotted, uh, already besotted Antony. And here, one of my favorites, Barnum and Bailey in 1912. I don't think this needs any commentary from me. The result in nine months later was a pair of twins programmatically named Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Cellini, Alexander the Sun and Cleopatra the Moon. And a uh, third child, uh, though Cleopatra is of course fourth, uh, Ptolemy the 16th Philadelphus in 37. Antony, ever the soldier, set himself up in Alexandria um, as um, uh, Cleopatra's consort and prepared for the reconquest of the East from the Parthian Empire, uh, which had established itself on the Eastern, uh, um, in the Eastern territories of the Seleucid Empire back in the second century BC. Uh, his campaigns got mixed results to say the least, but in 35, he did manage to invade and take Armenia and returned in triumph to Alexandria. The result was the so-called donations of Alexandria where um, he and Cleopatra divided up the conquered territories and the um, uh, rump of the Ptolemaic kingdom between themselves and their children. To uh, uh, celebrate or rather set the stamp on these so-called donations of Alexandria, they minted uh, some coins, which you can see here on the right-hand side. Again, um, two coins being two-faced, one has um, on the uh, topmost one of Antony, Armenia conquered, and below of Cleopatra, queen of kings and of children who are, queen, uh, who are kings. The legends are in Latin to make the alliance palatable to the army among whom these coins undoubtedly would have circulated. Uh, had they circulated in the um, uh, Greek parts of the kingdom, the legend would have been in Greek. So these are intended, as it were, to impress uh, Alexander's, uh, Alexander's uh, Antony's legionaries. So 
to make the alliance palatable to the army and to, to officially declare the distribution of Antony's conquests among Cleopatra's children, uh, a ceremony was also held in 34 in the great stadium of Alexandria, which not surprisingly uh, did not get a particularly good press in Rome. And Plutarch again fills us in on the details. Antony was hated in Rome too for the distribution which he made to his children in Alexandria. It was seen to be theatrical and arrogant and to show hatred of Rome. For after filling the gymnasium with a throng and placing on a dais of silver, two thrones of gold, one for himself and the other for Cleopatra and other lower thrones for his sons. In the first place, he declared Cleopatra queen of Egypt, Cyprus, Libya and hollow Syria. And she was to declare, she was to share her throne with Caesarion. Caesarion was believed to be the son of Caesar by, with whom Cleopatra was left pregnant. In the second place, Antony proclaimed his own sons by Cleopatra, kings of kings. And to Alexander, he allotted Armenia, Media and Parthia, when he should have subdued it, to Ptolemy, <coughs> and to Ptolemy, sorry, Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia. At the same time, also, he also produced his sons, Alexander arrayed in Median garb, that's Persian garb, with a tiara and upright headdress, Ptolemy in boots, short cloak, and broad rimmed hat, surrounded by a diadem. For the latter was the dress of the kings who had followed Alexander, the former that of the Medes and Armenians. And when the boys had embraced their parents, one was given the bodyguard of Armenians, the other of Macedonians. Cleopatra indeed, both then and at other times, when she appeared in public, wore a robe sacred to Isis, you've seen her in that, and was regularly addressed as the new Isis. So this was the apex of Cleopatra's fortunes. She had succeeded. Uh, she had succeeded in resurrecting the Ptolemaic Empire uh, via uh, the agency of the Roman armies of the East. She now ruled the whole of the former Greek East, uh, Greece, Asia, Syria, Egypt, fulfilling the wildest dreams of three centuries of the Ptolemies. Not surprisingly, Cleopatra um, celebrated in style. Here at the Hathor Temple at Dendera, we find her uh, on the left-hand side there, far left, and Ptolemy Kazarion uh, worshiping the Egyptian gods. And on the right, arrayed in uh, full Ramesside dress, um, uh, again from the same temple and a vignette from another processional scene. So these, are cast in the imperial court, right, court style of Ramses II, who ruled, of course, a thousand plus years earlier, proclaiming uh, Cleopatra, like him, as monarch of imperial Egypt. Then came the misstep. Two years later, in 32, Antony divorced his long abandoned Roman wife, Octavian's sister, Octavia, a fatal miscalculation. Not surprisingly, all hell broke loose in Rome. Ah, I was supposed to show you these just a second or so ago. Uh, Alexander, a portrait in New York, probably of Alexander Helios as king of Armenia, the young boy wearing the uh, extraordinary um, uh, pyramid hat of, uh, of, um, of the Armenians. And Cleopatra Cellini, who survived the whole debacle, as queen much later on of Mar Mauritania uh, in a silver dish from Bosco Reale. So, uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, all hell broke loose in Rome. Octavian proceeded to declare war on Cleopatra, not on Antony. This then was not to be a renewal of the Roman civil wars, but Rome's final reckoning with the last of the Hellenistic empires. The two sides met at Actium, here in Western Greece. In other words, on the um, disputed zone uh, between the two halves of the empire. 
on the 2nd of September, 31. Octavian's fleet was outnumbered two to one, and to make matters worse, his ships were smaller than the huge Ptolemaic battleships. Even though, even so, his great lieutenant, Agrippa, exploiting his uh, ship's greater maneuverability, pulled off the victory. On the right, you see two um, renderings uh, of it. At the top, um, at least a couple of Roman warships in Pompeii. Uh, below, uh, the Actium Fries in Cordova, probably found near Avellino in the Bay of Naples, and then taken to Spain uh, in the 16th century. And uh, currently uh, is being published by Hannes Schaefer in Tübingen. Uh, this is a vignette from it of um, Antony's uh, flagship. You can see he's just rammed a Roman ship. Uh, we know it's his flagship because it was called the Kentauros, the centaur. And lo and behold, this has a centaur figurehead. You can see it just at center left there. Uh, so an exciting new discovery. Well, and not quite new, but uh, dis discovered at least by classical archaeologists only some 20, 30 years ago in this private collection in, in Spain. Uh, the victor, Octavian, proceeded to set up a great victory monument on the spot where he had watched the battle uh, with presumably with bated breath um, from his throne on the, on the mainland, uh, watch Agrippa annihilate. Ptolemaic fleet. So this is the panorama from his uh, seat and the Victory Monument at Nicopolis, which I shot at the beginning of excavations about 10 years ago. They've proceeded uh, quite a lot since then, um, but I'm going to show you my slides of it anyway, since, since it gives you a very good idea of the monument itself, high on the hill above the modern village, which sits itself on top of, Alec, uh, on top of Augustus's Victory Foundation, that is uh, the town of Nicopolis. Here is the huge um, uh, inscription that you can probably make out on the far right-hand side, Vincit uh, uh, conquered, anyway, um, in, in Latin, of course. And then behind it, the terrace wall containing these cuttings uh, for the enormous beaks or rams of Cleopatra's battleships, captured battleships. So this is what the whole thing would have looked like. And above, uh, a portico containing a frieze of which uh, literally tens of thousands of fragments have been discovered and are currently being patiently um, uh, pieced together uh, in Patras uh, by, the, uh, by, the, by the excavator, Constantinus uh, Zakos. So here's the whole thing, at least as reconstructed in a small model uh, in Patras. So the finale. Early in 30 BC, Octavian marched on Egypt, rolling up Antony and Cleopatra's possessions in the east as he went. On uh, July 1 of 30, he laid siege to Alexandria stationing his army on the east, in other words, behind where the left-hand picture uh, is, uh, as it were, shot from. We're looking west here. And in the center, uh, you see the reconstructed uh, images of Cleopatra and Antony, and on the right, the Augustus and Prima Porta, uh, is, uh, as it were, uh, portraits. The final act occurred on August the 1st, 30. Antony, uh, summoning all his courage and his troops, marched out to do battle with, uh, August, with Octavian's army. The army, his army, uh, Antony's army, simply kept on marching, deserting en masse to Augustus, to, I keep on calling him Augustus, he's still Octavian at this time. Uh, to uh, Octavian. Antony, mortified, quite literally, tried to commit suicide, but botched it. Cleopatra rushed out, dragged him to her tomb, and where he died in her arms. Cleopatra then proceeded to barricade herself in her tomb, trying to negotiate with uh, Octavian. Oct uh, uh, the negotiations were a failure, quite simply because Octavian, who held all the cards, wanted her to parade her in his triumph back in Rome. 
according to one source. One of her maids was then persuaded to smuggle in a cobra. Uh, that is the sacred snake, the Urias, that she wore upon her wig uh, and whose bite was supposed to uh, confer immortality. This is what Gian Petrino is picturing here. She's uh, opening the lid to the box uh, or actually closing it with a cobra around her arm. More mundanely on the right hand side, we have what may be a picture of her end or possibly that of the Carthaginian princess Sophonisba uh, who um, opted for the same fate rather than be taken in a Roman triumph, drinking poison from a cup. In any case, the end result was the same. This was a fitting end for the greatest of the Hellenistic queens, the last trustee of the legacy of Alexander. She at least would never grace a Roman triumph. From her conquerors came not only a magnificent funeral, but an appropriate tribute to her memory. In Rome, it was said that during their thousand year history, the Romans feared only two human beings, a man and a woman. The man was Hannibal the Carthaginian, who in 218 BC famously had crossed the Alps with his elephants to stalk Italy for 15 years, defeating everything the Romans could throw at him. The woman was Cleopatra VII, Philopato, Thea of Egypt. And in the Hellenistic East, there could be no doubt now as to who were the masters. For the, for the perceptive, this had been clear for over a century. For the others, the gods provided the answer on that fateful night before Antony's humiliation and suicide and Octavian's occupation of the city. We return to Plutarch one final time. About the middle of the night, it said, while the city was quiet and depressed through fear and expectation of what was coming, suddenly harmonious sounds from all sorts of instruments were heard and the shouting of a throng accompanied by cries of Bacchic revelry and satiric hullabaloo. It was as if a troop of revelers, <coughs> excuse me, let me just take a drink of water here. Yeah. It was as if a troop of revelers making a great tumult were leaving the city and their course seemed to lie through the middle of town towards the outer gate facing the enemy. At that point, the tumult became loudest and then they dashed out of the gate. Those who sought the meaning of the sign concluded that Dionysus, the god to whom Antony always most likened and attached himself, was now deserting him. Of all those who have considered Alexander's legacy and thought upon the Hellenistic world's favorite god, few have understood this omen as well as the great modern Greek poet of Alexandria, Constantinus Gavafis. In 1911, Cavafi wrote a poem about that final night before the suicides of Antony and Cleopatra at last rang down the curtain on the Hellenistic world and the Ptolemaic Empire. You'll forgive me, I hope, if I offer you a translator, translation of it uh, to finish. And in the audience, though, I'll begin by quoting the beginning in the original Greek <clears throat> as best I can. Σαν έξαφνα, ώρα με σαν νύχτα ακούστη, αόρετος θεάσος να περνά, με μουσικές εξιέσεις, με φωνές, τη τυχή σου που ενδίδει πια, τα έργα σου που απέτυχα, τα σχέδια της ζωής σου, που βγήκαν όλα πλάνες. Μια νοφέλα τα θρηνήσεις, σαν έτοιμος από καιρό, σαν θεραλέος από χαιρέτα την, την Αλεξάνδρια που φέλγει. When suddenly at the midnight hour you hear an invisible procession passing by with exquisite music, voices, don't mourn your luck that's failing now, your work gone wrong, your life's plans all proving deceptive. Don't mourn them uselessly, but as one long prepared, as a courageous man, bid her farewell, the Alexandria that is leaving. Above all, don't fool yourself, don't say it was all a dream your ears deceive you. Don't degrade yourself with empty hopes like these. As one prepared, as a courageous man, as befits you a man worthy of such a city, go firmly to the window and listen with deep emotion 
but not with the whining, the entreaties of a coward. As one last enjoyment, listen to the sounds, to the exquisite music of that mystical procession, and bid her farewell, the Alexandria you are losing. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. And we, we can take some questions um, and we have some here. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, can you talk a little bit more or talk about um, your opinion on Cleopatra the seventh mother? <laughs> Ooh, no, I can't actually. Okay. Um, I've, if I ever knew, who was the wife of Ptolemy the 13th. I think she was another Cleopatra, Cleopatra, yes, you must have been. She was Cleopatra the sixth. Um, this, she would have been in lineal descent from Cleopatra one, who was the wife of Ptolemy the fifth, I think and of Syrian extraction. That means that <clears throat> that's when the two dynasties, um, the, uh, um, the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid intermarried just once in the early second century BC. So she would have been pure-blooded Macedonian as well. Uh, but I'm afraid I don't know anything about her. My um, specialty insofar as it exists is, uh, is uh, Greek art, particularly Hellenistic art, particularly sculpture, the, uh, let's say, the, the, the further corners of Hellenistic history, I'm afraid I have not, uh, I have not read up on. Okay, um, well, we'll go to the next, and please excuse me in advance, I'll, I'll ask for your help with some pronunciation. So the Pan-Africanism is a powerful galvanizing concept today with the ancient Ptolemies and native Egyptians have understood such a concept? No, no, they would not. And were they aware of and in communication with Eastern and Southern African kingdoms? Yes, they were. Unfortunately, our sources for Hellenistic history in general are very poor. Um, we have no continuous history from uh, 146 BC right the way through to the reign of Augustus. Um, the, uh, the, let's say, later, later um, uh, school, uh, schoolmasters um, were simply uninterested in it. The great examples were to be found in um, the Roman Republic uh, and in uh, classical Greece and so on, so that's what you learn. Um, but from what we know, what we have what we know, and what we can tell from archaeology, Yes, uh, the Ptolemaic kings were in communication, certainly with the Ethiopians um, uh, and with the kingdom of Meroe, just sort of between the two uh, kingdoms. And we're also in communication, very um, uh, strong communication with India and uh, places far east via the Red Sea. Um, they, just simply for geographical reasons uh, and, and otherwise though, uh, they're, um, main interests and attentions were directed north towards the um, Seleucid kingdom of Syria, again, one of Alexander's successor kingdoms, and also west. Uh, so, and furthermore, um, uh, although at a lower level, Greeks and Egyptians intermarried, um, we're not really talking about anything similar to Pan-Africanism at all. Uh, as I tried to show the dynasty itself kept itself very much apart in that regard. Cleopatra was apparently the first of the Ptolemies to even learn the Egyptian language. And as you know, the Egyptian relationship between the Egyptian peoples and Black Africa is somewhat fraught and I'm certainly not going to go there. Well, the rest of the question I think in my touched on this is would they have understood themselves as being African or is the idea of Africa a modern concept coming from European geographers? Uh, no, the idea of Af Africa as a continent was well known. It was known to Herodotus five centuries earlier uh, and even before that. Um, Africa, however, as a distinct single cultural entity 
certainly did not exist in the ancient Greek and Roman imagination. Because after all, the Phoenicians had, con had, had settled the North Coast. Um, uh, Carthage was a Phoenician colony uh, founded in the uh, 8th century BC. And um, the Egyptians considered themselves uh, separate from Black Africa, uh, as far as I know. Um, and uh, if the Ptolemies identified with anybody, it was with the Egyptian pharaohs um, of the of second and third millennium BC, as I think we've, we've seen. So I think this is, this is a, the, 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 the geographical concept of Africa was certainly there. After all, Alexander, as I said, wanted it all. And we have it, it, it explicitly said by his historians, he wanted uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa together. So geographically, no problem. Uh, as it were, culturally and racially, uh, Africa is not an entity as far as the ancient world was concerned. Hmm. So uh, Kathleen asks, when she was in Egypt a few years ago, it looked like there was no trace of Cleopatra. Is that true? I don't know. I haven't been to Egypt for years. Um, I was doing quite a bit of work there in the, excuse me, late 1980s and mid 1990s, but I'm afraid my attentions have been drawn back north to Greece and Turkey and, uh, and um, Italy since then. It doesn't surprise me though, at least when I was in Egypt, um, the regime uh, identified really with Ramesside Egypt, with uh, Ramses the Great and uh, the glories of the Egyptian empire in the second millennium BC. Um, I don't recall myself seeing any sign whatsoever of the Ptolemies around the place. It doesn't help the fact, of course, that Alexandria, um, ancient Alexandria, no longer exists. It's not like ancient Rome where you can go and walk around the city and see it. There are bits of it in the local museum, but only a very few monuments, such as so-called Pompey's Pillar, the Serapeon, and so on, are there to be visited, and the necropolis, the, uh, the tombs. So the, the presence of the Ptolemies, because Alexandria is a Ptolemaic city, uh, it is is basically negligible on the ground. Okay, this is a bit lengthy, but I'll put the, I'll say the question from Avi is: Is there a short thumbnail explanation for the British obsession with the drama of Roman history? Did other European uh, cultures similarly obsess over the history of this period? As we were recently reminded by Easter season on public TV, it seems as though the English think. The Ancient Mediterranean was a BBC production <laughs> filled with plummy proper accented speeches and snide rejoiners rather than any semblance of the actual situation from its own point of view. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Um, well, I left uh, England in 1969 for Greece and have never lived there since. I lived in Greece for many years and then um, going back and forth in New Zealand as well. And then I've been a Berkeley professor since 1979. So um, I'm hardly the one to uh, pontificate about what current British TV does and does not say about, uh, about the Mediterranean. I will say, however, that <clears throat> like, for example, the, 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 the French, um, the, the and uh, to some extent uh, no and also the Germans um, and certainly the Italians uh, the British have a um, felt at least when I was a kid a definite affinity with uh, republican and imperial Rome for obvious reasons um, you know British sort of stiff upper lip and so forth is exactly your Roman gravitas and severitas or at least was supposed to be um, and. Uh, uh, Plutarch, Plutarch's um, lives from Roman history were read. Uh, I read them as a kid. And uh, in, I happen to know that in, um, in France too, Regnard, the, the great um, uh, 18th century history of Rome was a required textbook in French schools up until I believe the 1950s. In, it went through dozens of editions. We have a beautiful uh, two volume set in the Bancroft Library, by the way, of about 1710. So. Um, the nation states of Western Europe have always, for one reason or another, considered themselves to be, as it were, spiritual kin to the Romans, 
uh, in one way or another, and or the sort of latter-day inheritors of their empire, or at least of their imperial ambitions. Uh, that's nothing new. The shadow of Rome is long uh, and, uh, and, and still potent. Thank you for that. Um, we've got um, a, a question about the statue here of Octavian. Um, can you comment on the tiny figure? Yeah. On the um, yeah. Yeah, that's his, one of his ancestors. It's Eros. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the, the Julii Caesares, uh, the clan of the Julius Caesars, uh, one of the oldest of the Roman patrician families, traced its um, ancestry uh, like the rest of the uh, patrician families back to the gods. In their case, it was the goddess Venus. Uh, by slate of hand, they were supposedly descended from um, uh, Venus's or Aphrodite's um, knight with uh, Aeneas. Uh, Aeneas had a son called Iulus, which if you just tweak him a bit, becomes Julius, uh, and thence sprang the Julian clan. So we have the little Eros riding a dolphin, referring to um, Aphrodite's son, or Venus's son, Cupid, and the dolphin referring to her. Uh, that's one of her attributes, because she was born on the, Aphrodite was born at the sea, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sea foam. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. an, ancient, uh, an ancient observer would have immediately picked this up. The, uh, the, the, the divine ancestries of the, uh, of the Roman patrician families were, were um, common knowledge and were much prized. But um, several uh, compliments about the um, uh, um, Cavafy um, uh, poem in Greek. Yeah. And um, thanking you. And a couple of people say it's their favorite poem and having it in, ah. in Greek. Um, let's see, another question um, from Ken is, at Actium, would you say Roman military technology was far superior to that of Ptolemaic um, Egypt? We don't know enough about the battle. Uh, our, um, again, I'm not a military historian. Um, our sources are poor. Plutarch is interested in character. He's not interested in military history. So he gives details, but he picks and chooses, he basically cherry picks. Uh, we have, I believe, Diodorus. No, I don't even think we have Diodorus. I don't know what other sources we have on the Battle of Actium, but they're not very good. Uh, what seems to have happened is that the lumbering Ptolemaic battleships were simply um, hardly outclassed, but at least outmaneuvered by, um, by uh, um, Agrippa and his much lighter warships. Uh, who had catapults and so forth. Um, and at least according to one source, it was Cleopatra who actually threw away the victory by panicking. But that's the problem with this, that our sources on Cleopatra are hostile. Plutarch is a hostile source. He didn't like Mark Antony. Uh, the whole point about that biography is essentially how Mark, Mark Antony went bad and got corrupted by an Egyptian queen. So... Um, uh, I'm not prepared to pronounce on that. What I think is, is clear, well, it's absolutely clear, that that victory of Agrippa's turned the um, Mediterranean definitively into what the Romans called Mare Nostrum, a Roman lake, the Roman sea. Hmm. Romans no longer needed to keep a fleet of large battleships up and they did, didn't have one right until the middle of the third century AD. They didn't need it. Okay, well, that, with that being said, we'll, we'll call it um, the end of the session and really want to thank you, Dr. Stewart, for sharing your expertise with us today. It's very interesting, um, intriguing.